tonight on Insight. Aboriginal or not? Who gets to determine who is Aboriginal? What happened when you applied to have your Aboriginality confirmed? I was denied. I like getting spat in the face. There needs to be a better system in place. You just have to look at me and tell I'm Aboriginal. I'm an Aboriginal Australian. You totally look like a white fella to me. We shouldn't be judging each other by colour. Hello, I'm Anton Enos, filling in for Jenny Brocky. Welcome to all of you. Let's get straight into it. Dallas, uh, Scott, uh, tell us what happened when you applied to have your Aboriginality confirmed. Mm, well, cut a long story short, I was denied. And when I went in to ask about it, I, no one had given me any response or anything why I was rejected until I went in the second time to actually have my Aboriginality approved. And then that's when they finally sat me down and said that they hadn't eyeballed me enough. And that's what it comes down to, that, that one board can turn around and say, right, we're all the ones sitting on the board to say, yes, you're an Aboriginal, when I can walk into any shopping centre and have a security guard follow me around. So, <laughs> as everyone sort of knows, it's just one of those things where, you know, when I tell my friends, hey, I got knocked back from your Aboriginality, all my friends just laughed at me and said, no, you've got to be kidding me. So when I thought about that, I just thought, no, this is, this is absolutely ridiculous. And as I find out later on, it was due to some personal issues that were going on. That's why I got mine actually knocked back. It was someone from the outside, talked to someone on the inside in the co-op, and um, well, I, was I was stopped straight away. So Dallas, how did it make you feel when you heard this news? I felt like it was a big joke, really. Serious. I mean, it, living where I am right now, like I'm still in emergency accommodation. I'm still, you know, still waiting for a house. Can't get any rental property. Um, I've never used the Aboriginal purse. I've always gone off my own back, work, worked hard, done my own thing. And then once I've come back to actually use one of these, these services, it's you know, like getting spat in the face. And well, you I, say it sounds like a bit of a joke and we can all have a laugh about it, that someone yeah. who looks like you can be knocked back. But yeah. We have your uncle here, Wilfred uh, Carter. What do you think when you hear that something like this happens to your nephew? Well, I think it's quite degrading, really. Mm. I mean, you go into organisations like this and you, the people are, are hired, coming out of here, white administrations comes out, in Aboriginal organisations, then they bring out these gammon blackfellas and they're the people who are, are going to be saying, prove that you're Aboriginality. Mm. Prove that you are who you are. Where these guys are fair-skinned, why, why don't they prove who they are? Why are they asked a person of Dallas's statue of his Aboriginality? Can't they see it? Are they blind? Mm. Why is it so? Let's uh, turn to Tara. Now, your story is slightly different in that you and your brother both applied to get this confirmation, but you've got different outcomes. Tell us about that. Yeah, so um, I was living in Canberra. I'd only been into Canberra for about three years. Um, I grew up in S Western Sydney. And um, we went in there and I was handed the form to fill in. And my brother, they just asked for his name and they said that they'd basically give him the certificate straight away. So basically straight on the spot was signed and given to him. Um, but for me, I had went through that process of filling it in and then came back to client. That sounded a bit bizarre. Did you think it was a bit strange? I thought it was strange that, yeah, my full blood brother that walked in with me at the same time could be accepted as Aboriginal, but same mother and father couldn't be. And the only basis I could base that on was, was the fact that he has um, slightly more olive skin than I do. So what happened then? Um, I honestly gave up for the next four or five years. I was sick of people questioning my Aboriginality because I had fair skin and needing to prove it constantly every day to people that I was Aboriginal because I had the fair skin. So eventually you did, did get the confirmation? Yeah, I initially, um, I had some issues though because I've never lived on my country. My, my father has never lived on country and my grandmother has never lived on country. So they moved quite early. So I've, I'm in the situation that even when I go back to where I grew up in Western Sydney, that no one there, know, they know my family, my grandmother and my father, but they don't know our family. And so even when I went back here, I had that issue. But I did um, go to a corporation where I'm from who does know my family and was able to get that process that way. But it was a difficult and a long one. So a corporation, of course, is one of the organisations that, that hands out these confirmations. Yep. Land councils are, are, are another organisation. So once you got the confirmation, it then took another twist because then you then uh, applied for a job. 
What, uh, what can you tell us about that? Um, back, it was only in 2010, so it's not that many years ago, I went for a job with Generation One. Um, and during that process, the lady that interviewed me um, said that she'd have to get back to me regarding the job because the, what she had been told is that she needed to hire an Aboriginal person that looked Aboriginal. Um, so I received the phone call the next day to inform me that um, I wasn't to get the job because they had cut their numbers. So not that I wasn't, because she went away to check, you know, about the colour issue, and what had come back was they were cutting numbers. So that was a bit <coughs> funny. Did it seem odd to you in the sense that you thought you did look Aboriginal? Oh, oh, to be honest, I know I don't look Aboriginal. I look at myself, I see my mother completely. She's of Scottish heritage. I don't deny that at all. Um, so I understand when people see me face value that I don't look what they expect to see of an Aboriginal person. And I think that in, it, that in itself is an issue. I just want to mention that Warren Mundine is in the, the audience today, who is the CEO of, of uh, Generation One. But it was outside of your tenure that this happened, and the company did apologise. Yeah. But just but give but us but a still sense. on the same, the same basis, it wasn't Generation One. We hired a company to do a service <laughs> for us. That company then subcontracted to do a service for us. That company then uh, made this horrible situation worse. So our, the former CEO then come out and apologise for that. And it did give us an opportunity to raise the issue of the diversity of Aboriginal people. At the same time though, I guess as a corporation, if I'm hiring somebody who's going to hire somebody, I need to take 100% responsibility for anything that they may or may not say. As an Aboriginal corporate company wanting to aim to in increase Aboriginal employment, we should have been hiring PR companies that uh, have Aboriginal focuses and not companies that have no idea about Aboriginality. What is your background? What is your Aboriginal ancestry? Well, my, my dad's a Wiradjuri man um, from out near Piambong and um, he has yeah, an Aboriginal mother and a um, non-Aboriginal father. Um, and my mum, both, my mum's non-Aboriginal. So I have one Aboriginal grandparent. So if, if I were to ask you to describe yourself, what would you say? I'm an Aboriginal Australian. That's, that's how I categorise myself because being Australian, my, my mum's family has been out here right from, the, um, from white um, invasion. Dallas, what about you? My father, he passed away just recently, um, Campbell Carter. He was the, um, the eldest son of um, Charlie Carter, who was the man who got Lake Ties handed back to the Aboriginal people. Um, so, you know, and also my mother, she's from Wollega Lake. Yeah, that's my grandfather. Yeah, so I've, I've come from a proud man like him. And after hearing all the, the great stories that I've heard, I'm, I feel very proud of who, who my parents and grandparents were. Well, another story is Brianna, who, has, uh, get, uh, who is trying to get into the Queensland Police. You've been sitting exams recently, I believe. Yep. But in order to do that, you wanted to get your Aboriginality confirmed. Tell us what happened in your case. Well, um, what I've done is... I've applied through Queensland Police Force and I've gone through the same entry as everybody else and I've just sat that exam waiting to hear back but I do want to have that back up as if I don't pass the exam what everyone else has to do is they can't resit the exam for another 12 months whereas I get the back up of being able to apply for the JEP program. What is the JEP program? Um, for Aboriginal um, and Torres Strait Islander people so they do an extra six months at the academy, brings them up to speed with everyone else basically before they go into the academy and do all their training. What's well, sitting right next to you is your father, Leslie. Uh, what can you tell us about the process that Brianna's been through in trying to get this uh, confirmation? Well, yeah, we, we just uh, approached our local Aboriginal Land Council and the same thing. Um, you know, you, go, you turn up and say, well, I'd like to apply for it now. They tell you that we don't know you, and and when you when you um, you know your history, you know your tribal clan, and you got other people saying, "Well, we we, are, we can't accept," or you get rejected. How long had you lived in the area, Leslie? Uh, Twenty-four years. Pretty long time. Yeah, my two girls are born in Tweed Heads area. I can understand that they want to stop a lot of people claiming that they using these services and that. Do you think Brianna needs that service, that additional assistance? Could she have just got through on her own merits? Well, that's what she's doing, but um, 
that that's just there for a backup. And so we just decided we'll go down and get our um, apply for that um, confirmation. So having had this experience, what is your opinion now of how the system works? Well, I think there needs to be a better system in place. Um, as it, you know, and a lot of us here would feel like, you know, as I said, you know your history and that. Why do I have to really prove when you just have to look at me and tell I'm Aboriginal? Um, the other young lady at the front, I can concur with her too, because I've, I've got cousins that are, you know, fair skin too, but they're, you know, my mum's sister's auntie, their son, white as, but, you know, they've still got to go through that process also. Faye, you were knocked back. You and your siblings yes. applied to the Redfern Council. Yes. What was your experience? Absolutely disgusting. Was, what went on in that meeting was horrifying. They called us liars, they abused us. I've tri I tried twice. And um, my sis they've then voted, three sisters. My sister missed out by one vote. Yep, me and my other sister. We just miss out altogether. So at that point, did you identify as Aboriginal? They didn't know me in the community. I've always, all my family, friends know me as an Aboriginal, always. But because I never grew up in that area at that time, I, my family have been in Waterloo 120 years. My mum died two years ago, been there 90 years. And we weren't good enough because the people have just come in and taken Waterloo Redfern over, been there 20, 30 years. They, they don't want to know the people that were there. And, and the whole meeting was hor horrific. What reason did they give you for knocking you back? Uh, none of them knew us. And all the paperwork we had, it could be all lies. The photographs can't be yours. So, in an official sense, you were deemed not to be Aboriginal. Yes. But in your heart, how do you feel? I've always known. You only have to look at my mum. I've always known where we were. My mum, though, my beautiful mum denied it to her grave. But she grew up in a bad time. So why would that have been? Why would she have denied it? Well, she had a son. He was born dark and she gave him to her elder brother to rear because he was whiter than her. Because they'd have taken him from her. She said, my grandfather said, you've got to give him to your brother because he's whiter. He will be able to keep him. You, they'll take him from you. So she gave him up. So. so what do you know of your family history that traces the... It's very hard to find out. But we received a letter from the um, Aboriginal, well, I can't think of it, in Canberra, and they stated they are connecting my family to the Darik tribe. And at that meeting in Redfern, one woman said she's never even heard of the Darik tribe. So... Well, we have the CEO of the Land Council that uh, Faye applied to here with us, Paul Morris. Good evening to you. Uh, do you remember the, this case? What, uh, what was the reason for uh, Faye being knocked back? This was a little bit before my time, but uh, it's very disappointing to hear that, uh, you know, the treatment she got. Um, to, to be considered for a member, uh, to become a member, um, you have to be adult Aboriginal, reside in the local area. And the other part to it is be accepted by the community as an Aboriginal person. So was it was it just a judgment call? Do you need proof? Yeah, How does it work? Um, <coughs> Aboriginal people know each other down here in Sydney, even though it's a very transient place, and we've got people coming from all over the countryside uh, to live, work, go to school, uh, go to university. A lot of the community that live around the place know each other and they're connected to a lot of people all over the state. So when someone comes here, they'll know your family name or, you know, they can connect you to a family group that they know. Um, if, if people get knocked back um, or refused, that we ask them to go back to their community where they're recognised, where they're acknowledged. But in this case, there was a family living there for decades. It yeah. seems yeah. unusual these, these that are they wouldn't be known that, in the being community. Being in Sydney, that, that we come up against a lot because, you know, this, this, this is such a transient place and, and, and the membership changes so much sometimes. So... Yeah, it, look, it's, what yeah. do you think of that, Faye? There was a woman, that came, a young girl came in after us. We were sitting there after we'd been denied. She was from Darwin. She was there in Sydney for one week. She stood up, said I'm Aboriginal. They took her. Straight from Darwin. No connection to the... Well, she had no paperwork, nothing. Is it a transparent process, Paul? Well, it's 
And I could only speak for Metro Land Council. Um, it's one that seems to be working. Um, you know, it's not perfect, and I don't think there is a process that is perfect. But I think we also have to... Acceptance by membership, and the boards of land councils are a new thing, and there's very prescribed things that board members have to do, and acceptance and confirmation is not one of them, and that's not passing the buck, but membership is for all of the members. It's horrifying to hear it goes to votes. Um, I think explanation processes and saying where you're from Absolutely. is probably a much better way, but uh, I think drawing that connection so it's not just board members who are sitting in this considered judgment of other people. Can I just and say that there's a big reason for that? Um, you know, a lot of Aboriginal students uh, are missing out on scholarships. You know, a lot of Aboriginal people are missing out on jobs because there are people that do come in and say they're Aboriginal when they're not. And there's, there's you know, this, this puts everyone in two minds about membership. And like I said, that's up to that group of members to determine whether they accept this person into that membership as a member. That's, that's their role. You know, if they don't... You know, there's, there are other places they can go outside of a land council. It's self-determination, but it's an imposed system anyway. I sit on the board of my land council, even though I don't live there, and it's, it's one of the most difficult issues. Well, so how, how subjective then would the, the process be? I mean, I think if people take time... Subjective, yes, in a way, but that also underscores that there's actually a complexity, of the, a complexity that Aboriginal people get involved with when they are trying to engage other Aboriginal people where they're from. Who's your mob? It actually means something, and if people spend the time engaging with those people then I don't think it's, you know, it's, it's not a yes-no vote, here's my um, paperwork. You know, talking through the, and face to face, that's the way we deal with it, um, and it's not, it's not an, an inquisition, it's mm. actually a conversation, so people actually feel comfortable that th their history and their experiences, complicated as they are, are actually being listened to. The issues are fairly clear-cut, but you still, I would assume, have to knock some people back. Is it, does it happen very often? Well, you also have to take it extremely seriously. And the other thing I would say is getting a confirmation is absolutely not a rejection of your Aboriginality. A confirmation does not make you Aboriginal. You know, so I think we've got to be very clear about those kind of things. I mean, Dallas would, you know, you walk down the street, so a certificate of not. Sorry, Annie Pat. The issues that we've been hearing so far have shown just how ridiculous it is to have a formal set of criteria that someone has to adhere to. Obviously, what we should be looking at is first, why were those criteria established? What was the philosophy behind them? And we know those three criteria off the top of our heads. That's uh, ancestry, clear enough, self-recognition as an Aboriginal, self-determination, clear enough. But the third one, was originally intended for the community in which you yeah. lived. It did not mean only Aboriginal communities or Aboriginal organisations. It meant that your neighbours knew that you were Aboriginal and if you were going to get some uh, vague benefit out of declaring yourself Aboriginal, then you weren't doing it in a hidden, secretive way, but you were quite open and honest about your Aboriginality. And once you are public about your Aboriginality, there's no way you can ever reverse it. So, Dallas, Mark says a little piece of paper doesn't define whether you're Aboriginal or not, but did you feel that it was a comment on your identity? Well, yeah, it, it was. And as I said, I never used any of these services until my life went downhill real quick and that was due to um, things that were out of my control. Um, you know, my wife having depression, my son and my foster parents and my real brother passing away. It's all in one year. I get hit with all this. So I've got to try and pick myself up, swallow my pride and go into the, one of these places and then I've got all them people telling me, hey, no, we're going to tell you whether you're Aboriginal or not. There's so many so. stories. That, Mark, we haven't heard your story yet. What is your <laughs> Aboriginal ancestry? I'm Wiradjuri. My family, four generations, have been in Trangi and, um, you know, that's pretty much it. My great-great-grandmother was born in the Lachlan Valley and my great-grandmother was born on the banks of the Macquarie River the day the um, railway came to Dubbo and then Mum and Nan were both born in Trangi and that's where I grew up. So, um, I saw you described once as blonde, blue-eyed and fair-skinned. I'm not so sure yeah. about the blonde anymore. But no, no. Do you, have no you that's always, the biggest fear, the, you know. In spite of, in st in spite of the, uh, your appearance, have you always identified as Aboriginal? What I 
find interesting about this conversation is if you've got a choice about it. When you grow up in a small country town, uh, I was... We didn't have choice about identity. We were that Aboriginal family. There's a couple of other people who went through the Andrew Bolt litigation and um, that was probably the most offensive thing ever to happen in my life where somebody from the outside questioned you. You know, I was raised by my mother and grandmother. My father was never, and he's English, never featured in my life. So my experiences are just that. We have to get it right tonight. We can't keep fighting amongst ourselves anymore. The Aboriginality is a cultural construct. We make it. We define it. Well, tonight on Insight, we're talking about Aboriginal identity. Well, Dallas, I've had a look at your blog. It's a pretty straight-talking, hard-hitting kind of uh, forum. Tell us about it and why you started it. Well, I was going through all of this, getting rejected. I thought to myself, why not? And, you know, it just sort of snowballed from there. If... You're not shy about pointing a finger and saying, no, you know, no, you no. say you're Aboriginal, but you're really not. That's pretty daring stuff. If they want to identify as Aboriginal, that's great, because the Aboriginal people, we, you know, we're open. But when the people do uh, say that they are Aboriginal, stand up and be proud. But don't put your hand in the till where the money goes, that the money needs to be sorted out and go into the right people. Like, there's kids out there that's still going hungry, and but yet there's people going through universities um, who sorry to say, but they're white, and we've still got little black kids running around that don't have any shoes on, or they're still hungry. It's about time that us black fellas said, right, the kids need the money. It's more, it should be more of a needs-based sort so of thing. So where do you draw the line between those that should qualify for assistance and those that should not? Yeah, uh, well, for qualifying for assistance, I'm only looking at that if they need the money, whereas they don't need the money um, going through the universities, right? Because I didn't. I mean, geez, I didn't go to the university, but yeah. I've so, had a life experience. Yeah, I'll just jump in here. I, I actually, I'm Aboriginal, I'm Wiradjuri. My grandfather was born at Brungle Mission. I grew up my whole life being Aboriginal. And my colour is not any, anything about my Aboriginality. My colour is something that was imposed through colonisation. And I am Aboriginal. And the, no, and, the, and the sort of mention of the fact that, you know, Indigenous students going to university somehow don't need assistance is not right. Because what we're doing is the same thing that was done to us. We're judging each other by colour. It's not right. No, that's right. no. no. We're the ones who get coloured and is, pointed at. What but I'm saying is that we shouldn't be judging each other by colour. We judge each other by our Aboriginality, our ancestry, yeah, our relationship to is, each other. Is, as digitally black people are discriminated against because we're black. But we're I mean, I've had to forego that many jobs because of my skin. Yeah, but not I get it too. because I'm Aboriginal. But I'm black. Yeah, but I'm I get it too. To look at. But yeah. I get it too. I'm not doing my job because I didn't look black. So I, I understand proved. that there is discrimination yeah, for those that look black. But you don't understand what he said. Oh, I completely. I, don't, I, I have, don't get it. I have drove down the street at Redfern in a car as well, going to work, and being pulled up and me car searched. Now, have you ever had that done? No, and I can completely agree Why that because you I don't had look that up, done? But I also get, like, what well, people consider reverse racism, but it's still r racism. Just because I don't look black doesn't mean I'm not Aboriginal. Doesn't mean that I've grown up that way, and it doesn't mean that I can't be proud of who I am. Just because I don't have skin colour makes me no different to any of you that have colour. My family is my family, my community is my community. We all know that, but just because I'm let's white get a doesn't comment. mean... Let's get a comment from Best Price. I've just got one question. Why don't you acknowledge the other heritage that you have yes. and I do. be proud of it I do. Oh, my and just Scottish. not go one way. I, I completely agree. Because I can stand up and say I'm a black fella and I've got one blood and that's it. Yep. But my daughter, whose father is sitting next to me, she mm. acknowledges the father mm. and, and the other heritage that she has. She doesn't just say that she's a black fella. Oh, my, and that's and, my and, and I if know that, that has to happen here in Australia so we can all then, you know, be honest and equal with each other and understanding because it creates that division, you know? It creates a division. Look, I, di I didn't know you were a black fella as well because I'm sitting here and you totally look like a white fella to me. 
That's your but, view. Excuse me, but sorry, but you know it, that we have to acknowledge that and just say that, you know, for the sake of all these Do other people. Now, no, hang on. Let me finish. Let me finish. Excuse me. Let me finish because you know, out there, my people are on the ground, got nothing else. All of this is yeah, sounding yeah, an awful that's... lot like the Darwinian Can stuff that came in when colonisation yeah. happened, what where colour could be spread out with every single generation. Right. Could, we, could, could we have Boiled one person at a time, yeah. please, Graham? Yeah, but, yeah look, but, yeah, um, right. I think um, the conversation is getting out of, out of control here a bit, and you've got to ask yourself why Aboriginal that's people right. have to conform and comply to a definition of their being. It's something... Hang on, hang on. It was, look, it's something that has been imposed on Aboriginal people right from the time of European occupation. And Mark hit it on the head before. Uh, people in powerful positions, uh, such as uh, shock jocks and people in media, um, they, they tend to have a field day trying to divide and rule Aboriginal people. That is, on the one hand, people that are what they regard as the real Aboriginal people and people on the other side of the, of, of the coin that are, you know, not, um, uh, not dark, not noticeably Aboriginal. This is what we've got to stop. We cannot afford to get sucked in to this fighting amongst ourselves. Simple solution. Let anyone identify any way they want. Yep. What I do question is how benefits are handed out. So exactly. you can say, I know in my heart I'm Aboriginal, yep. etc., etc. But when it comes to handing out benefits and services, yep. it should be done on That's need. Now also the benefits are too Let me finish, too please. Small. Let me finish, please. I get a lot of emails. People ask me this question all the time. Why is it that some people who claim Aboriginality, they they focus on one sixteenth of their ancestry and they forget the other fifteen sixteenths of their ancestry. I'm, I am a part Aboriginal person. I'm part European, part Aboriginal, very proud of both ancestries. I have an Aboriginal father, an Aboriginal mother. My life does not begin and end with my Aboriginality. Let's get a comment from Greg. You've actually been attacked, you say, because of your identity. What do you think about how your experience of, in terms of what you look like has affected your response from other people? Um, <clears throat> no, but I'll say something else. And the reason I won't answer your question is because this isn't a safe space and I'm not going to disrespect my parents who have passed away, my grandparents who have passed away by mentioning their names or having their photos put up when there's not um, a safe, respectful cultural environment here. That's tough. That's and the, the reason I say that, and Mick Gooder has been putting this out there for people to, to start thinking about recently, and the issue is, and I think we've seen a very good example of it tonight, the issue is lateral violence. We have learned some very, very bad habits from the coloniser. The weapons of the oppressor become the weapons of the oppressed, and we rip each other to shreds. Money's part of it. Um, one of the elders in Launceston, who's passed all. away now, yeah. has said... Uh, to me, the first job I got out of uni was an yes. Aboriginal liaison officer and she said to me, when I was talking to her one day, she said, Greg, the money changed everything. OK, it seems to be this idea of skin colour and what you look like seems to be pretty divisive. And I think it's deliberately set up that that's the way it is. I mean, who gets to determine who is Aboriginal? And I think once you actually start to speak to... to people whatever the way or however they look it's how they've lived their life I mean I have seen my family be spat at I've been when I grew up I was the albino bong like there is absolutely a lived experience that comes with Aboriginality and that is not predicated on skin colour and yet we're all out here saying oh but you looking whiter than me have had a more privileged existence than me and I rally against that understanding because we are Aboriginal by definition because of the what's been imposed, but it's also because of the way other treat people have treated us and our families. So it's a very Dave, convenient Dave, definition right. for some too. Mm -hmm. Dave. For who? Dave, got can, just, can we just hear from Dave Price? Yep. I am white, I look white and I am white and I'm quite <laughs> proud of it. Um, I'm married to a Wallaby woman and we've kept the marriage together for over 30 years, which is better than most white fellas and black fellas do these days. And I have three grandsons. Two of the grandsons are very fair, fair-haired, blue-eyed. The middle one is brown-skinned, brown-eyed. They have four grandparents. One of them is Aboriginal. My youngest grandson, 
the fairest one of the lot came home from school one day and very upset because he said, those white kids told me, Judge, that I'm, I'm too white to be a black fella. <laughs> My Wildbury wife got very upset on his behalf and was, wanted to go down to school and sort him out black fella way. I mm. talked her out of that. <laughs> I was going to just go to show them my face. That's, That's all, right. Anton. <laughs> I said to, to him, confirm it. I said to him, look at me, I'm your grandfather, I love you, You're, you have my blood too. I want you to be just as proud of me. I also want you to be proud of your other white grandfather and your other black grandmother who is not Aboriginal. You are not just Aboriginal, but be really That's proud right. of that, inher that, inher that heritage. Be proud of all the heritage. Now, a very clear majority of Australians who call themselves Indigenous have children with people who aren't. 80% of their kids identify fully as Indigenous. What about the rest of us? They're our families too. You're either yeah, Aboriginal or not. I don't call myself Indigenous. I'm Aboriginal. Indi Indigenous <laughs> is a government word. But the, well, the issue I'm is I'm Aboriginal identity. I'm now, the problem yeah. I have with it, and, and I'm not saying you're not black, but there are non-Aboriginal people claiming to be Aboriginal, yes. taking our jobs, making yes. our jobs hard for us, live in my shoes and work where I work, and you'll notice what the, the difference is between being white Aboriginal and black Aboriginal, and I can tell you. Yes. You know, well, it's, about, it's about who you are. Now, my mum's Gamilaroi, my dad's Wanarua, which is Coonabarabin, the Hunter Valley. That's, that's my ancestry, and I can go back a long way on that. We're going to get some comments from people who haven't had a chance yet. Yes. Yes. Okay. It's a hard topic, and if we can't get it right here, nowhere, nowhere else can. So if we don't stop fighting amongst ourselves, looking, oh, well, you're not black enough, or you're too white, or something like that, oh. our generations and the kids, and the kids who fall between the gaps of every services, whether they can get an Aboriginal um, confirmation or not, will fall by the wayside for another six, seven generations. We have to get it right tonight. We can't keep no, fighting amongst ourselves right anymore. <laughs> the Aboriginality is a cultural it, construct. We right make it. Us. We define it. I think the thing that we're most frustrated about is the fact that people can claim Aboriginality and not do anything with their power if they get a job. Mm. I think every Aboriginal person who goes for these jobs mm. feels they have an obligation to do good for their people. I think that's the thing that we have to concentrate on is that f not the fact that your, your skin colour or where you, um, it doesn't matter where you come from, I'm very lucky to say that I grew up on country but I think the thing is we need to see the issue as people who can, are claiming one sixteenth or whatever of their Aboriginality to get money. Warren Mundine, you work for an organisation that's trying to move the communities forward. What do you think when you hear these stories? To be quite honest, I've, um, I'm actually feeling pretty sad at the moment. This is pretty oh, depressing. Yeah. Uh, one of the things I find quite interesting is this, this discussion about Aboriginality and about skin colours and about this and about that, but it doesn't recognise the wide range of, of experiences of Aboriginal people. There were people who uh, were taken away as young as, and, and were forced into the white system, uh, so they lost their country. They lost their language. They didn't do that by choice. It was just forced upon them. And then they had children and then they had children. So two or three generations away, they discovered that they had Aboriginality in them. And now because they, had, they discovered they had Aboriginality, it's about the pride in that. But some people had this forced upon them and they had no choice in the whole matter. And then two or three generations later, they discovered they got Aboriginal ancestry and they're proud of that ancestry. We should engage with those people. We should welcome them back to our country. We should not beat them up and flog them and chase them away and treat them like, <laughs> treat them like some sort of bad disease or something like this. And this is all I'm hearing today. And it's not about skin colour and about this. If, if things have to be based... If, if it's about helping people out of poverty or helping people with houses, helping people with jobs, and everything, then that should be on a needs base. Exactly. I'm very proud of my Aboriginality. It is not a burden on me. It is not a problem for me. I love it. I'm proud of it. And this is what we've got to start talking about. Rather than having these silly arguments about, oh, you're blacker than me, you're whiter than me, or you can't speak language. Well, 
you can't speak language because the white men beat you up 100 years ago and forced you not to speak language. Uh, you, uh, you don't do dance anymore because white men come and beat you up and force you not to dance anymore. So it's about time we started recognising all these different experiences of, of our community and start pulling together as people rather than saying, oh, we don't like you. Or having stupid things like the Aboriginality Forum where you go to a meeting and you've got to sit in front of ten or five or six people who actually judge your Aboriginality, which is bizarre to me. One thing we have noticed in the, the, the recent census, 2011, there was a 20% rise in people who identify as Aboriginal. Anthony Dillon, what do you make of that? Well, the definition being the way it is, um, it's quite elastic. You know, you can find out that your great-great-grandmother was Aboriginal and therefore, under that definition, you can identify. And I guess it's that, that person's right to identify. So I think that's what explains the, the large increase. Do you have any concerns about that rise? Yeah, um, one of the problems, and we've, we've discussed this in this forum here, is, you know, it comes back to need again, and I think because there's such a, a diverse range in terms of need within those, that group who identify as being Indigenous, you'll have those who are very poor, poor socioeconomic status, those who are quite well off, and you get this averaging effect so you have pockets of extreme disadvantage that can be masked, and I think that's a problem when you lump everyone into that category of Aboriginal. Um, so, you know, people from Bess's area, when she can describe the horror stories she sees, then you have people in the city like me, all ticking that box Aboriginal, mm. and you lose the, the, the depth. Let's just it's get a quick... I know we're, I've we, been we, too we, close. I know we we'll get a quick... We haven't heard from Matilda. Matilda, Matilda there, you've come to us all the way from Broome. Why do you think well, more think people I'm are identifying life. as Aboriginal? I'm, I'm really upset and annoyed because the way people are sort of talking to Bess, I mean, I live up north with... Like in one of our Bronxes in Broome, I've been up in the Kimberley for over 30 years. And this is the closest we've got to a full-blood Aboriginal here in all of us. So we need to respect, as much as we respect each other, that she has got her language, she has got her culture, she has got her, her skin group, she has got her bush name. And everybody is born in different places, OK? Mm. I cannot believe, like, Dallas has had to get forms to say he's Aboriginal. I mean, I can look at him, I can say, how are you going, my son? How are you going? I mean... Everybody, you can talk to them and you have that feeling, it's an Aboriginal feeling that's hard to describe inside you. We look for people like outside, we found some people, straight away we walked up and I found um, my mate there and never sort of, I maybe met him years ago but I can't remember, at a taxi and all of a sudden we had that connection, hey we're going to the same place, let's jump in the same taxi. So being Aboriginal is respecting that we all have something in common and we need to share a journey from our grandparents, our friends, our family. Let's get a quick comment mm. from some of our younger people mm. in the audience here, Todd and Medina. How important is that link to land, to your traditional uh, conventions and practices? Well, I think we have to remember that there was a time if you identified to be Aboriginal, you would have been bashed, you would have been discriminated against, you would have been taunted. And there was a time when they suppressed their Aboriginality because that was the time that they grew up in. And that was the only thing that they knew how to do to protect themselves and protect their families and protect their kids. But now as Aboriginality in today's society is being seen as something to be proud of, especially with Aboriginal people being proud to be Aboriginal, a lot of families now are coming out saying that, you know, I'm black because, you know, I'm proud to be Aboriginal. And now that in a time where Aboriginal people can be proud to be Aboriginal, they won't identify. We have people, Aboriginal people, who use lateral violence to do exactly what the white fellas done to us when they came over. Dallas, Dal Dal let me just get a comment from you. As well, you know, You're people listening to this. Yeah. yeah. Well, I've, I've, I've heard... I've heard it before white people came here. Sorry, Arnie. Um, I've heard all the speaking that's been going on, and as I said, I've gr I grew up as a black man. Now, I had foster white parents. I grew up in a white area. Now, like, as you said, when you were growing up, you had those problems, which is, yeah, I know, I do understand. But then, you can walk out there tonight and get a cab, sure. whereas I can't, mm -hmm. all right? Now, I'm not, I'm not denying your Aboriginality or your heritage. All I'm saying is, 
It's, everyone says, right, we've got to close the gap for the young, you, you, the young kids. Why don't we argue about what's happening with these poor kids? Your identity is a spirit, a set of values, a force which informs your decisions, which is a product of story and of journey. That is something the government can never give you. Well, tonight we're talking about Aboriginality and identity. Well, the corporations and the land councils are two of the organisations you can go to to get your Aboriginality confirmed. Warren Mundine, what do you think of the way that system works? I think there's uh, too much um, subjective uh, uh, put, uh, put on people. Um, you know, people, you know, we've heard the stories tonight, you know, we heard Dallas, where a community just said, no, you're not Aboriginal. We heard other people say the same things. I think there's better ways of doing it. I, as I said, I work for an organisation prior to this one I'm working for now, which is the NTS Corp, which deals with native titles, people's connection to their, to their heritage and to their descent and, to, and their identity as Aboriginal people. And through that process, uh, we've built this tremendous database what we found is that each stolen generation, Aboriginal people who weren't taken away, uh, people who lived on countries, people who have moved off countries, we've been able to track them. Uh, 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 you know, we, we can find who, out who they are, where their families are from. We've got that all on digital database. Does the system work fairly, in your opinion? I think that system works quite fairly because it doesn't make the decision about do you identify as an Aboriginal person, uh, are you proud? And you're, it just actually says by descent and your connection to that country and it's got no politics involved in it all, got no subjective behaviour involved in it all. It's just a clear, you are, here's your descent and where you come from. We haven't, we haven't heard from Des Williams yet. Uh, what do you think of this council system? I, I chair the Tweed Byron Local Aboriginal Land Council and uh, we, have a, we have a system in place that allows us to, uh, to hand out um, confirmation of Aboriginality. Um, when a, a, a submission comes in from, from a person, it's, it's first looked at by the board of the, the land council. And if the people on the, on the board of the land council can't agree uh, with this person's right to be given a, a, an Aboriginality uh, form, then it goes to the members and the members decide. But the initial, the initial uh, advice given to the applicant is that if you don't come from this area, if your people don't come from here, uh, Tweed Heads uh, or Tweed Byron in this instance, then you have to go back to where your people come from, where your family comes from. What do you think of that, Leslie? Well, it shouldn't have to. I mean, I have got um, my proof um, from um, my great-great-grandfather first taken from traditional way of living. It's, I've got it from the University of New South Wales. It shows my tribe, my totem, my, um, my tribal name, which is Eulari. So, and it's all documented through the university. Uh, and clearly now you look at me, I'm Aboriginal, I'm proud Aboriginal. I've got all this documented, so all I need to do is present that to them instead of going back to uh, Brewarrina, where I'm from, there should be some process in place where they could just ring up Brewarrina Land Council and... Well, I think one of the, the, the points of the, the, the Land Council and the co-op system is that they confirm people's Aboriginality, which allows them to access financial help. Anthony Dillon, is there a better way of moving forward then? Yeah, as... Can we just listen to Anthony, yeah. please? I think, as has been said by a few people, if we focus on needs first, um, then I think there'd be less people wanting to claim their Aborig right. Aboriginality. If they wanted, that's fine. They that's can claim really it and they can get together to and, that. and tell each other stories, that's fine. But let's focus on need. You can't claim Aboriginality. You are Aboriginal or you're not no. Aboriginal. You don't have there a choice. Processes. When I was born, I was born Aboriginal. When I die, I die Aboriginal. Everything in between is Aboriginal. Yes, yeah. I have another part of me, but I don't claim anything. jobs and high positions you're in, not because you're Aboriginal, because your education and the criteria you fit 
being yeah. Aboriginal is only one part of that. Yeah. If but it's on that of, form. But, Auntie, part of the point, too, is when these identified people come up, when whether we do it by need or whatever, it's the actual what you do with it, I think the young lady yeah, up the back it said it, counts. and it's that concept of cultural responsibility yeah. and how you put that back in. Back Just role modelling alone. So, yeah. you know, it's still vitally important that you have Indigenous identified positions at university because that obviously then, those people, every Aboriginal person that I have I have known that has gone to university works in Aboriginal affairs in a professional capacity in their communities. So this assumption that as soon as you get educated you lose your Aboriginality or you only yeah, engage with it for that. If you're putting it back into the community, exactly, but, yes, well, accepted, but, that's my point. but not if Most you're just there to you know, get higher and higher and exactly use your that. Aboriginality and your people. We haven't heard from the woman at the... No, no, hold on a second. Thank you. Um, look, I, I've listened to this discussion tonight and I came here tonight uh, as a stolen generation survivor from Tasmania. And I've listened to all the issues um, around identity and I, I really appreciate what you're saying about knowing each side of you, your, your mother's side, your father's side. Uh, some of us don't know that. We don't have that appreciation. And we talk about access to services uh, and you've got to go back to your own country. Some stolen generations don't know where their country is. So what I say to these services is, are you putting things in place to address these needs of the stolen generations? Right at the back. Okay. I'd just like to say that, um, going back to what Warren was saying earlier, that I am a descendant of a, sto a member of the stolen generation. My great grandmother was born in, uh, was removed from her her, her mother, um, in Broome, Western Australia. So, um, and from there she became a missionary herself and, and travelled um, from Australia to the Torres Strait to Papua New Guinea, which is where I was born, where my mother was born, where my grandmother was born. So. For me, identifying as, as an Aboriginal person is not so much a need for me, it's a right that I have because my great-grandmother was from this country. Okay. Um, I'm also stolen, Jen. I last year got my Certificate of Aboriginality and honestly felt that by receiving that, I belong somewhere. And I think that most stolen Jen would probably feel like that. It's not about... I would love the fact that I was in contact with my um, Aboriginality as a, a traditional, completely dark, Aboriginal, knowing country, land and whatever, but I wasn't born that way. But um, to identify as Aboriginal... When I got my Aboriginality certificate, I actually um, was elated. It was like receiving my birth certificate. Um, so that's really... You know, at the end of the day, it's what we're about. It's identifying and, and knowing where you're from and the people that um, were meant to be your families um, and reconnecting. Medina, you haven't had a chance to speak. Uh, I just wanted to acknowledge that, you know, we're a very passionate people, so it's we're just touching on surface issues. We've also um, come from a really disadvantaged past as Indigenous people. We need a lot of self-healing, but also um, talking about... Sort of, um, we need to really focus on solutions now, moving forward in healing in our journey for our younger generations. Let's get a comment from Shane Houston. There are three issues that have collided in this conversation. The first one is about identity. The second one is about heritage. And the third one is about needs. Let's go to the first one about identity. I've been working in Aboriginal affairs for nearly 40 years. I've seen Aboriginal people of all sorts of colours, but who are incredibly proud of their identity. That is a construct of self, not of anybody else. It's yourself. Right. Your identity is a spirit, a set of values, a force which informs your decisions, which is a product of story and of journey immersed in our identity. That is something the government can never give you. That's right. No organisation can give you that. Your family, your community, yourself give you that identity. The second question is about heritage. Now, I've known people that have had conversations with me that said, Shane, I'm not Aboriginal, but I grew up in West Wyalong, and I think if I go back far enough, I'm sure I'd be able to find. Why aren't I Aboriginal? And I'm saying, and my response to them was, that might be part of your heritage, and you should be very proud of it, just as I'm very proud of my mother's English heritage. They can be very proud of their Aboriginal heritage, but it is not their identity. It is not that story and journey which informs their decisions. 
The third thing that's come, that's collided in this conversation is the question of need. Now, we've, we've criticised in some ways the definitions that we use in Australia, but at least ours is consistent, it's survived for nearly 40 years, and it's a lot better than definitions that exist in other parts of the world. If you're Apache in the US, for example, one group you have to be half caste. Another group, you have to be quarter caste. Mm. The next group of Apache, you have to be one eighth. So there is it of blood, and they have a DNA test. Mm. So it is incredibly complex. So the question of services, which all the people have raised here, access to services, is something that should be based on need. I earn a good wage. My kids shouldn't have to access those services. I look after my kids. There are Aboriginal people at the university I work at who, without scholarships, would never get an opportunity absolutely the case. And let's not say just because we went to, we've got Aboriginal kids in Scots or Andrews or, you know, any of the big schools around Sydney, that they don't have needs. They all come from families, and I've met most of these kids, single parent families, out bush, and they've made a decision to give their kids something better. Let's not judge them on the fact that they go to those schools. Let's judge them on what their needs are. We have to reconcile those three issues. We're going to take one final comment just about what this discussion is saying about your sense of identity. Um, I think what excites me is that there is absolutely a direction forward and we're using, and, as, and what excites me the most is young people are using the expression of rights and how our own cultural rights will affect our future. That we actually have such a large youth population, I think the engagement with that is the way forward in a, in a complicated, complex way while acknowledging the history. Well robust, energetic and passionate. Thank you all for taking part, but we have to wrap it up. But of course, you can keep talking online. Go to our website, Twitter or Insights Facebook page. Is sparing the rod spoiling the child? Or is smacking a type of child abuse? I don't think um, there is anything wrong with me smacking. When there is a need. I would use a smack in order to show consequences, I guess. I can't imagine smacking a tiny child that's under five. I'm going to hit him, even when he's 70, because I'm the mother. A great program coming up next week. Stay tuned now for Dateline and World News Australia. Good night. I can say, how are you going, my son? How are you going? I mean everybody you can talk to them and you have that feeling it's an aboriginal feeling that's hard to describe inside you we look for people like outside we found some people straight away we walked up and i found um my mate there and never sort of I maybe met him years ago but i can't remember at a taxi and all of a sudden we had that connection hey we're going to the same place let's jump in the same taxi so being aboriginal is respecting that we all have something in common and we need to share a journey from our grandparents, our friends, our family. Let's get a quick comment mm. from some of our younger people mm. in the audience here, Todd and Medina. How important is that link to land, to your traditional uh, conventions and practices? Well, I think we have to remember that there was a time if you identified as the Aboriginal, you would have been bashed, you would have been discriminated against, you would have been taunted. And there was a time when they suppressed their Aboriginality because that was the time that they grew up in. And that was the only thing that they knew how to do to protect themselves and protect their families and protect their kids. But now as Aboriginality in today's society is being seen as something to be proud of, especially with Aboriginal people being proud to be Aboriginal, a lot of families now are coming out saying that, you know, I'm black because, you know, I'm proud to be Aboriginal. And now that in a time where Aboriginal people can be proud to be Aboriginal, they won't identify. We have people, Aboriginal people, who use lateral violence to do exactly what the white fellas done to us when they came over. Dal Dallas, let me just get a comment from you. You're listening to this. Yeah. Well, I've, I've heard. I've heard. Before white people came here. Sorry, Arnie. Um, I've heard all the speaking that's been going on, and as I said, I've gr I grew up as a black man. Now, I had foster white parents. I grew up in a white area. Now, like, as you said, when you were growing up, you had those problems, which is, yeah, I know, I do understand. But then, you can walk out there tonight and get a cab, sure. whereas I can't. Mm -hmm. 
all right? Now, I'm not, I'm not denying your Aboriginality or your heritage. All I'm saying is, it's, everyone says, right, we've got to close the gap for the young, y y the young kids. Why aren't we arguing about what's happening with these poor kids? Your identity is a spirit, a set of values, a force which informs your decisions, which is a product of story and of journey. That is something the government can never give you. Well, tonight we're talking about Aboriginality and identity. Well, the corporations and the land councils are two of the organisations you can go to to get your Aboriginality confirmed. ...ourselves anymore. The Aboriginality is a cultural construct. We make it. We define it. Well, tonight on Insight, we're talking about Aboriginal identity. Well, Dallas, I've had a look at your blog. It's a pretty straight-talking, hard-hitting kind of uh, forum. Tell us about it and why you started it. Well, I was going through all of this, getting rejected. I thought to myself, why not? And, you know, it just sort of snowballed from there. If... You're not shy about pointing a finger and saying, no. you know, no. you no. say you're Aboriginal, but you're really not. That's pretty daring stuff. If they want to identify as Aboriginal, that's great because the Aboriginal people, we, you know, we're open. But when the people do uh, say that they are Aboriginal, stand up and be proud. But don't put your hand in the till where the money goes. That the money needs to be sorted out and go into the right people. Like there's kids out there that's still going hungry, and but yet there's people going through universities um, who sorry to say, but they're white, and we've still got little black kids running around that don't have any shoes on, or they're still hungry. It's about time that us blackfellas said, right, the kids need the money. It's more, it should be more of a needs-based sort so of a So where do you draw the line between those that should qualify for mm. assistance and those that should not? Yeah, uh, well, for qualifying for assistance, I'm only looking at that if they need the money, whereas they don't need the money um, going through to the universities, all right, because I didn't. I mean, geez, I didn't go to the university, but yeah. I've so had a life experience. Yeah, I, I actually, I'm Aboriginal, I'm Wiradjuri. My grandfather was born at Brungle Mission. I grew up my whole life being Aboriginal. And my colour is not any, anything about my Aboriginality. My colour is something that was imposed through colonisation. And I am Aboriginal. And the, no, and, the, and the sort of mention of the fact that, you know, Indigenous students going to university somehow don't need assistance is not right. Because what we're doing is the same thing that was done to us. We're judging each other by colour. It's not right. No, that's right. no. We're the ones no, who get coloured no, and um, pointed at. What I'm but saying is that we shouldn't be judging each other by colour. We judge each other by our Aboriginality, our ancestry, yeah, our relationship to is, each other. Is, as digitally black people are discriminated against because we're black. But we're also I mean, I've had to forego that many jobs because of my skin. Yeah, but not I get it too. because I'm Aboriginal. But I'm black. Yeah, but I'm I get it too. To look at. But yeah. I, I get it too. My job because I didn't look black. So I, I understand proved. that there is discrimination yeah, for those that look black. Is, but you don't understand what he said. Oh, I completely. I, I am. There's a little piece of paper doesn't define whether you're Aboriginal or not. But did you feel that it was a comment on your identity? Well, yeah, it it was. And as I said, I never used any of these services until my life went downhill real quick, and that was due to. <laughs> Um, things that are out of my control. Um, you know, my wife having depression, my son and my foster parents and my real brother passing away. It's all in one year. I get hit with all this. So I've got to try and pick myself up, swallow my pride and go into the, one of these places. And then I've got all them people telling me, hey, no, we're going to tell you whether you're Aboriginal or not. There's so many so. stories. That, Mark, we haven't heard your story yet. What is your <laughs> Aboriginal ancestry? I'm Wiradjuri. My family four generations have been in Trangy and, um, you know, that's pretty much it. My great-great-grandmother was born in the Lachlan Valley and my great-grandmother was born on the banks of the Macquarie River the day the um, railway came to Dubbo and then Mum and Nan were both born in Trangy and that's where I grew up. So um, I saw you described once as blonde, blue-eyed and fair-skinned. I'm not so sure yeah. about the blonde anymore. But no, no, do you, have that, you that's always, the biggest fear, you know. In spite of 
in, st in spite of the, uh, your appearance, have you always identified as Aboriginal? What I find interesting about this conversation is if you've got a choice about it. When you grow up in a small country town, uh, I was... We didn't have choice about identity. We were that Aboriginal family. There's a couple of other people who went through the Andrew Bolt litigation and um, that was probably the most offensive thing ever to happen in my life where somebody from the outside questioned you. You know, I was raised by my mother and grandmother. My father was never, and he's English, never featured in my life. So my experiences are just that. We have to get it right tonight. We can't keep no, fighting yeah, amongst ourselves right anymore. The the Aboriginality is a cultural yeah, construct. We right make right. it. We define it. Well, tonight on Insight, we're talking about Aboriginal identity. Well, Dallas, I've had a look at your blog. It's a pretty straight-talking, hard-hitting kind of uh, forum. Tell us about it and why you started it. Well, I was going through all of this, getting rejected. I thought to myself, why not? And, you know, it just sort of snowballed from there. If you're not shy about pointing a finger and saying, no, you know, no, you no. say you're Aboriginal, but you're really not. That's pretty daring stuff. If they want to identify as Aboriginal, that's great, because the Aboriginal people, we, you know, we're open. But when the people do uh, say that they are Aboriginal, stand up and be proud. But don't put your hand in the till where the money goes. That The money needs to be sorted out and go into the right people. Like, there's kids out there that's still going hungry, and but yet there's people going through... That understanding, because we are Aboriginal by definition because of the what's been imposed, but it's also because of the way other treat people have treated us and our families. So it's a very Dave, convenient Dave, definition right. for some, too. Mm -hmm. Dave. For who? When Dave, got can, just, can we just hear from convenient. Dave Price? Yeah. I am white, I look white, and I am white, and I'm quite <laughs> proud of it. Yeah. Um, I'm married to a Wallaby woman and we've kept the marriage together for over 30 years, which is better than most white fellas and black fellas do these days. And I have three grandsons. Two of the grandsons are very fair, fair-haired, blue-eyed. The middle one is brown-skinned, brown-eyed. They have four grandparents. One of them is Aboriginal. My youngest grandson, the fairest one of the lot, came home from school one day and very upset because he said, those white kids told me, Jaja, that I'm, I'm too white to be a black fella. <laughs> My Wallaby wife got very upset on his behalf and was wanted to go down to school and sort him out blackfellow way. I talked her out of that. I was going to just go and show them my face. That's, That's all, right. Anton. <laughs> I said to, to him, confirm it. I said to him, look at me, I'm your grandfather, I love you, You're, you have my blood too. I want you to be just as proud of me. I also want you to be proud of your other white grandfather and your other black grandmother who was not Aboriginal. You are not just Aboriginal, but be really That's proud right. of that, inher that inheritance. Be proud that of heritage. all the heritages. Now, a very clear majority of Australians who call themselves Indigenous have children with people who aren't. 80% of their kids identify fully as Indigenous. What about the rest of us? They're our families too. You are either Aboriginal or not. I don't call myself Indigenous. I'm Aboriginal. Indig Indigenous <laughs> is the government word. But the, well, the issue more, is well, Aboriginal identity. identity. So Aboriginal. Now, the problem I have with it, and, and I'm not saying you're not black, but there are non-Aboriginal people claiming to be Aboriginal, yes. taking our jobs, making yes. our jobs hard for us, live in my shoes and work where I work, and you'll notice what the, the difference is between being white Aboriginal and black Aboriginal, and I can tell you. Yes. You know, well, it's, about, it's about who you are. Now, my mum's Gamilaroi, my dad's Wanarua, which is Coonabarabin, the Hunter Valley. That's, that's my ancestry, and I can go back a long way on that. We're going to get some comments from people who haven't had a chance yet. Yeah, sure. Yes. Okay. It's a hard topic, and if we can't get it right here, nowhere, nowhere else can. So if we don't stop fighting amongst ourselves, looking, oh, well, you're not black enough or you're too white or something like that, oh. our generations and the kids and the kids who fall between the gaps of every services, whether they can get an Aboriginal um, confirmation or not, will fall by the wayside for another six, seven generations. We have to get it right tonight. We can't keep no, fighting no, amongst ourselves right anymore. The <laughs> Aboriginality is a cultural it'll, it'll construct. We right make it. it. We define... Guys are fair-skinned. Why don't you... Why don't they prove who they are? Why are they asked a person of Dallas's statue of his Aboriginal? Can't they see it? Are they blind? Mm. Why is it so? 
let's uh, turn to Tara. Now, your story is slightly different in that you and your brother both applied to get this confirmation, but you got different outcomes. Tell us about that. Yeah, so um, I was living in Canberra. I'd only been into Canberra for about three years. Um, I grew up in Western Sydney. And um, we went in there and I was handed the form to fill in. And my brother, they just asked for his name and they said that they'd basically give him the certificate straight away. So basically straight on the spot was signed and given to him. Um, but for me, I had went through that process of filling it in and then came back to client. That sounds a bit bizarre. Did you think it was a bit strange? I thought it was strange that, yeah, my full blood brother that walked in with me at the same time could be accepted as Aboriginal, but same mother and father couldn't be. And the only basis I could base that on was, was the fact that he has um, slightly more olive skin than I do. So what happened then? Um, I honestly gave up for the next four or five years. I was sick of people questioning my Aboriginality because I had fair skin and needing to prove it constantly every day to people that I was Aboriginal because I had the fair skin. So eventually you did, did get the confirmation? Yeah, I initially, um, I had some issues though because I've never lived on my country. My, my father has never lived on country and my grandmother has never lived on country. So they moved quite early. So I've, I'm in the situation that even when I go back to where I grew up in Western Sydney that no one there, know, they know my family, my grandmother and my father, but they don't know our family. And so even when I went back here, I had that issue. But I did um, go to a corporation where I'm from who does know my family and was able to get that process that way. But it was a difficult and a long one. So a corporation, of course, is one of the organisations that, that hands out these confirmations. Yep. Land councils are, are, are another organisation. So once you got the confirmation, it then took another twist because then you then uh, applied for a job. What, uh, what can you tell us about that? Um, Back, it was only in 2010, so it's not that many years ago, I went for a job with Generation One. Um, and during that process, the lady that interviewed me um, said that she'd have to get back to me regarding the job because the, what she had been told is that she needed to hire an Aboriginal person that looked Aboriginal. Um, so I received the phone call the next day, informed me that um, I wasn't to get the job because they had cut their numbers. So not that I wasn't, because she went away to check, you know, about the colour issue and what had come back was they were cutting numbers. So that was a bit <coughs> funny. Did it seem odd to you in the sense that you thought you did look Aboriginal? Oh, oh, to be honest, I know I don't look Aboriginal. I look at myself, I see my mother completely. She's of Scottish heritage. I don't deny that at all. Um, so I understand when people see... find interesting about this conversation is if you've got a choice about it. When you grow up in a small country town, uh, I was... We didn't have choice about identity. We were that Aboriginal family. There's a couple of other people who went through the Andrew Bolt litigation and um, that was probably the most offensive thing ever to happen in my life where somebody from the outside questioned you. You know, I was raised by my mother and grandmother. My father was never, and he's English, never featured in my life. So my experiences are just that. We have to get it right tonight. We can't keep fighting amongst ourselves anymore. The Aboriginality is a cultural construct. We make it. We define it. Well, tonight on Insight, we're talking about Aboriginal identity. Well, Dallas, I've had a look at your blog. It's a pretty straight-talking, hard-hitting kind of uh, forum. Tell us about it and why you started it. Well, I was going through all of this, getting rejected. I thought to myself, why not? And, you know, it just sort of snowballed from there. If you're not shy about pointing a finger and saying, no, you know, no, you no. say you're Aboriginal, but you're really not. That's pretty daring stuff. If they want to identify as Aboriginal, that's great, because the Aboriginal people, we, you know, we're open. But when the people do uh, say that they are Aboriginal, stand up and be proud. But don't put your hand in the till where the money goes. That the money needs to be sorted out and go into the right people. Like there's kids out there that's still going hungry, and but yet there's people going through universities um, who, sorry to say, but they're white, and we've still got little black kids running around that don't have any shoes on, or they're still hungry. It's about time that us black fellas said, right, the kids need the money. It's more. It should be more of a needs based. Sort so of where do you draw the line between those that should qualify for assistance and those that should not? Yeah, uh, well, for qualifying for assistance, I'm only looking at that if they need the money, whereas they don't need the money um, going through the universities, right? Because I didn't. I mean, geez, I didn't go to the university, but yeah. I've so had a life experience. Can I just jump in here? 
I, I actually, I'm Aboriginal, I'm Wiradjuri. My grandfather was born at Brungle Mission. I grew up my whole life being Aboriginal. And my colour is not any, anything about my Aboriginality. My colour is something that was imposed through colonisation. And I am Aboriginal. And the, no, and, the, and the sort of mention of the fact that, you know, Indigenous students going to university somehow don't need assistance is not right. Because what we're doing is the same thing that was done to us. We're judging each other by colour. It's not right. No, that's right. No. We're the ones no. who get colour. No, what I'm saying... ...now is us to, uh, to hand out um, confirmation of Aboriginality. Um, when a, a, a submission comes in from, from a person, it's, it's first looked at by the board of the, the Land Council. And if the people on the, on the board of the Land Council can't agree uh, with this person's right to be given a, a, an Aboriginality uh, form, then it goes to the members and the members decide. But the initial, the initial uh, advice given to the applicant is that if you don't come from this area, if your people don't come from here, uh, Tweed Heads uh, or Tweed Byron in this instance, then you have to go back to where your people come from, where your family comes from. What do you think of that, Leslie? Well, you shouldn't have to. I mean, I have got um, my proof um, from um, my great-great-grandfather, first taken from traditional way of living. It's, I've got it from the University of New South Wales. It shows my tribe, my totem, my, um, my tribal name, which is Eulerai. So, and it's all documented through the university. Uh, and clearly now you look at me, I'm Aboriginal, I'm proud Aboriginal. I've got all this documented, so all I need to do is present that to them instead of going back to uh, Brewarrina, where I'm from, there should be some process in place where they could just ring up Brewarrina Land Council and... Well, I think one of the, the, the points of the, the, the Land Council and the co-op system is that they confirm people's Aboriginality, which allows them to access financial help. Anthony, Dylan, is there a better way of moving forward then? Yeah, as... Can we just listen to Anthony, yeah. please? I think, as has been said by a few people, if we focus on needs first... Um, then I think there'd be less people wanting to claim their Aborig right. Aboriginality. If they wanted, that's fine. They that's can claim really it and they can get together to and, that. and tell each other stories, that's fine. But let's focus on need. You can't claim Aboriginality. You are Aboriginal or you're not no. Aboriginal. You don't have no, a choice. Processes. When I was born, I was born Aboriginal. When I die, I die Aboriginal. Everything in between is Aboriginal. Yes, I have another part of me, but I don't claim anything. jobs and high positions you're in, not because you're Aboriginal, because your education and the criteria you fit being Aboriginal is only one part of that, yeah. if but it's on that the, form. But, Auntie, part of the point, too, is when these identified people come up, when, whether we do it by need or whatever, it's the actual what you do with it. I think the young lady yeah, up the back said it. it. Yeah, and it's that good. concept of cultural responsibility yeah. and how you put that back in. Back Just role modelling alone. So, yeah. you know, it's still vitally important that you have Indigenous identified positions at university because that obviously then... Thing that, you know, I'm black because, you know, I'm proud to be Aboriginal. And now that in a time where Aboriginal people can be proud to be Aboriginal, they won't identify, we have people, Aboriginal people, who use lateral violence to do exactly what the white fellas done to us when they came over. Dal Dallas, let me just get a comment from you. As well, you know, me You're listening to this. Yeah. yeah. Well, I've, I've, I've heard... I've heard... Before white people came here. Sorry, Arnie. Um, I've heard all the speaking that's been going on, and as I said, I've gr I grew up as a black man. Now, I had foster white parents. I grew up in a white area. Now, like, as you said, when you were growing up, you had those problems, which is, yeah, I know, I do understand. But then, you can walk out there tonight and get a cab, sure. whereas I can't, mm -hmm. all right? Now, I'm not, I'm not denying your Aboriginality or your heritage. All I'm saying is, it's... Everyone says, right, we've got to close the gap for the young, the young kids. 
Why don't we argue about what's happening with these poor kids? Your identity is a spirit, a set of values, a force which informs your decisions, which is a product of story and of journey. That is something the government can never give you. Well, tonight we're talking about Aboriginality and identity. Well, the corporations and the land councils are two of the organisations you can go to to get your Aboriginality confirmed. Warren Mundine, what do you think of the way that system works? I think there's uh, too much um, subjective uh, uh, put, uh, put on people. Um, you know, people, you know, we've heard the stories tonight, you know, we heard Dallas, where a community just said, no, you're not Aboriginal. We heard other people say the same things. I think there's better ways of doing it. I, as I said, I work for an organisation prior to this one I'm working for now, which is the NTS Corp, which deals with native titles, people's connection to their, to their heritage and to their descent and, to, and their identity as Aboriginal people. And through that process, uh, we've in, built this tremendous database. What we found is that each stolen generation, Aboriginal people who weren't taken away, uh, people who lived on countries, people who've moved off countries, we've been able to track them. Uh, 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 you know, we, we can find who, out who they are, where their families are from. We've got that all on digital database. But does the system work fairly, in your opinion? I think that system works quite fairly because it doesn't make the decision about do you identify as an Aboriginal person? Uh, are you proud? And you're, it just actually says by descent and your connection to that country. And it's got no politics involved in it at all, got no subjective behaviour involved in it at all. It's just a clear, you are, here's your descent and where you come from. We haven't, we haven't heard from Des Williams. My wife having depression, my son and my foster parents and my real brother passing away. It's all in one year. I get hit with all this. So I've got to try and pick myself up, swallow my pride and go into the, one of these places. And then I've got all them people telling me, hey, no, we're going to tell you whether you're Aboriginal or not. There's so many so. stories. Uh, Mark, we haven't heard your story yet. What is your <laughs> Aboriginal ancestry? I'm Wiradjuri. My family... Four generations have been in Trangi, and um, you know that's pretty much it. My great great grandmother was born in the Lachlan Valley, and my grand great grandmother was born on the banks of the Macquarie River the day the um, railway came to Dubbo. And then Mum and Nan were both born in Trangi, and that's where I grew up. So uh, I saw you described once as blonde, blue-eyed, and fair-skinned. I'm not so sure yeah. about the blonde anymore. But no, no. Do you, have that, you that's always, the biggest fear. That, you know, in spite of. In, st in spite of the, uh, your appearance, have you always identified as Aboriginal? What I find interesting about this conversation is if you've got a choice about it. When you grow up in a small country town, uh, I was... We didn't have choice about identity. We were that Aboriginal family. There's a couple of other people who went through the Andrew Bolt litigation and um, that was probably the most offensive thing ever to happen in my life where somebody from the outside questioned you. You know, I was raised by my mother and grandmother. My father was never, and he's English, never featured in my life. So my experiences are just that. We have to get it right tonight. We can't keep no, fighting really amongst ourselves right anymore. The Aboriginality is a cultural yeah, construct. We right make right. it. We define it. Well, tonight on Insight, we're talking about Aboriginal identity. Well, Dallas, I've had a look at your blog. It's a pretty straight-talking, hard-hitting kind of uh, forum. Tell us about it and why you started it. Well, I was going through all of this, getting rejected. I thought to myself, why not? And, you know, it just sort of snowballed from there. If... You're not shy about pointing a finger and saying, no. you know, no. you no. say you're Aboriginal, but you're really not. That's pretty daring stuff. If they want to identify as Aboriginal, that's great because the Aboriginal people, we, you know, we're open. But when the people do uh, say that they are Aboriginal, stand up and be proud. But don't put your hand in the till where the money goes. That the money needs to be sorted out and go into the right people. Like there's kids out there that's still going hungry, and but yet there's people going through universities um, who sorry to say, but they're white, and we've still got little black kids running around that don't have any shoes on, or they're still hungry. It's about time that us black fellas said, right, the kids need the money. It's more, it should be more of a needs-based sort so of So where do you draw the line between those that should qualify for assistance and those that should not? Out of ten or five or six people who actually judge 
your Aboriginality, which is bizarre to me. One thing we have noticed in the, the, the recent census, 2011, there was a 20% rise in people who identify as Aboriginal. Anthony Dillon, what do you make of that? Well, the definition being the way it is, um, it's quite elastic. You know, you can find out that your great-great-grandmother was Aboriginal and therefore, under that definition, you can identify. And I guess it's that, that person's right to identify. So I think that's what explains the, the large increase. Do you have any concerns about that rise? Yeah, um, one of the problems, and we've, we've discussed this in this forum here, is, you know, it comes back to need again, and I think because there's such a, a diverse range in terms of need within those, that group who identify as being Indigenous, you'll have those who are very poor, poor socioeconomic status, those who are quite well off, and you get this averaging effect, so you have pockets of extreme disadvantage that can be masked, and I think that's a problem when you lump everyone into that category of Aboriginal. Um, so, you know, people from Bess's area, when she can describe the horror stories she sees, then you have people in the city like me, all ticking that box Aboriginal, mm. and you lose the, the, the depth. Let's, let's just get a quick... I know we're, I've we, been we, too we, close. I know we, we, get a quick, we haven't heard from Matilda. Matilda, Matilda you've, you've come to us all the way from Broome. Why do you think well, more think people are identifying life. as yeah. Aboriginal? I'm, I'm really upset and annoyed because the way people are sort of talking to Bess, I mean, I live up mm. north with, live like in one of our Bronxes in Broome. I've been up in the Kimberley mm. for over 30 years. And this is the closest we've got to a full-blood Aboriginal here in all of us. So we need to respect, as much as we respect each other, that she has got her language, she has got her culture, she has got her, her skin group, she has got her bush name. And everybody is born in different places, OK? Mm. I cannot believe, like, Dallas has had to get forms to say he's Aboriginal. I mean, I can look at him, I can say, how are you going, my son? How are you going? I mean... Everybody, you can talk to them and you have that feeling, it's an Aboriginal feeling that's hard to describe inside you. We look for people like outside, we found some people, well, straight away we walked up and I found um, my mate there and never sort of, I maybe met him years ago but I can't remember, at a taxi. And all of a sudden we had that connection, hey we're going to the same place, let's jump in the same taxi. So being Aboriginal is respecting that we all have something in common and we need to share a journey from our grandparents, our friends, our family. Let's get a quick comment mm. from some of our younger people mm. in the audience here, Todd and Medina. How important is that link to land, to your traditional... What do you make of that? Well, the definition being the way it is, um, it's quite elastic. You know, you can find out that your great-great-grandmother was Aboriginal and therefore, under that definition, you can identify. And I guess it's that, that person's right to identify. So I think that's what explains the, the large increase. Do you have any concerns about that rise? Yeah, um, one of the problems, and we've, we've discussed this in this forum here, is, you know, it comes back to need again, and I think because there's such a, a diverse range in terms of need within those, that group who identify as being Indigenous, you'll have those who are very poor, poor socioeconomic status, those who are quite well off, and you get this averaging effect so you have pockets of extreme disadvantage that can be masked, and I think that's a problem when you lump everyone into that category of Aboriginal. Um, so, you know, people from Bess's area, when she can describe the horror stories she sees, then you have people in the city like me, all digging that box Aboriginal, mm. and you lose the, the, the depth. No, it's not the same. No, not the same. Let's, let's just get a quick... I know we're, I've we, been we, too we, close. I know we, we get a quick... Come. We haven't heard from Matilda. Haven't Matilda, haven't you've come to us all the way from Broome. Why do you think well, more think people I'm are identifying life. as yeah. Aboriginal? I'm, I'm really upset and annoyed because the way people are sort of talking to Bess, I mean, I live up mm. north with... Live like in one of our Bronxes in Broome. I've been up in the Kimberley mm. for over 30 years. And this is the closest we've got to a full-blood Aboriginal here in all of us. So we need to respect, as much as we respect each other, that she has got her language, she has got her culture, she has got her, her skin group, she has got her bush name. And everybody is born in different places, OK? Mm. I cannot believe, like, Dallas has had to get forms to say he's Aboriginal. I mean, I can look at him, I can say, how are you going, my son? How are you going? I mean... 
everybody. You can talk mm. to them and you have that feeling. It's an Aboriginal feeling that's hard to describe inside you. We look for people like outside. We found some people. Well, straight away we walked up and I found um, my mate there and never sort of, I maybe met him years ago, but I can't remember, at a taxi. And all of a sudden we had that connection, hey, we're going to the same place, let's jump in the same taxi. Mm. So being Aboriginal is respecting that we all have something in common and we need to share our journey from our grandparents, our friends, our family. Let's get a quick comment mm. from some of our younger people mm. in the audience here, Todd and Medina. How important is that link to land to your traditional uh, conventions and practices? Well, I think we have to remember that there was a time if you identified as the Aboriginal, you would have been bashed, you would have been discriminated against, you would have been taunted. And there was a time when they suppressed their Aboriginality because that was the time that they grew up with. From where your family comes from. What do you think of that, Leslie? Well, you shouldn't have to. I mean, I have got um, my proof um, from um, my great-great-grandfather, first taken from traditional way of living. It's, I've got it from the University of New South Wales. It shows my tribe, my totem, my, um, my tribal name, which is Eulari. So, and it's all documented through the university. Uh, and clearly now you look at me, I'm Aboriginal, I'm proud Aboriginal. I've got all this documented, so all I need to do is present that to them instead of going back to uh, Brewarana, where I'm from, there should be some process in place where they could just ring up Brewarana Land Council and... Well, I think one of the, the, the points of the, the, the Land Council and the co-op system is that they confirm people's Aboriginality, which allows them to access financial help. Anthony Dillon, is there a better way of moving forward then? Yeah, as... Can we just listen to Anthony, yeah. please? I think, as has been said by a few people, if we focus on needs first, yeah. um, need. then I think there'd be less people wanting to claim their Aborig right. Aboriginality. If they wanted, that's fine. They that's can claim really it and they can get together to and, that. and tell each other stories, that's fine. But let's focus on need. You can't claim Aboriginality. You are Aboriginal or you're not no. Aboriginal. You don't have no, a choice. Processes. When I was born, I was born Aboriginal. When I die, I die Aboriginal. Everything in between is Aboriginal. Yes, yeah. I have another part of me, but I don't claim anything. jobs and high positions you're in, not because you're Aboriginal, because your education and the criteria you fit. Being Aboriginal is only one part of that. Yeah. If but it's on that form. But, Auntie, part of the point, too, is when these identified people come up, when, whether we do it by need or whatever, it's the actual what you do with it. I think the young lady yeah, up the back said it. it. And it's that concept of cultural responsibility yeah. and how you put that back in. Back Just community. role modelling alone. So, yeah. you know, it's still vitally important that you have Indigenous identified positions at university because that obviously then... Those people, every Aboriginal person that I have... I have known that has gone to university works in Aboriginal affairs in a professional capacity in their communities. So this assumption that as soon as you get educated you lose your Aboriginality or you only yeah, engage with it If you're putting it back into the community, exactly, but, yes, well, accept that's accepted, but, but not if you're just young there Aboriginal to, you know, get higher and higher and, higher and, exactly and use your that. Aboriginality and your people. We haven't heard from the lab woman at the... No, no, hold on a second. Thank you. Um, look, I, I've listened to this discussion tonight and I came here tonight uh, as a stolen generation survivor from Tasmania. And I've listened to all the issues um, around identity and I, I really appreciate what you're saying about knowing each side of you, your, your mother's side, your father's side. Uh, some of us don't know that. We don't have that appreciation. And we talk about our 